at uh, Johns Hopkins. Um, so Emily has uh, done uh, modeling work. That's kind of how I know her. Um, and her work is to, I'll, I'll quote what she wrote here, to guide TB control interventions through a combination of epidemiologic data and mechanistic modeling. So particular interest and an interest locally as well is this whole question of natural history of TB and subclinical TB. And so we're quite keen, Marcel and I have been having some debates over latent TB. So hopefully you can inform us and educate us. Uh, so Emily, it's a pleasure, please over to you. So I just quickly remind everybody to try to mute if you have questions, please send them through chat. I don't know, Emily, if you want to entertain questions as you go, or we'll just wait to the end. Um, I'm happy to stop as we go. I'm, I'm hoping that it'll like, not be more than half an hour or so of me talking, so there should be time for discussion. And um, yeah, but I'm happy to stop maybe clarifying things as we go, and then hopefully have some time for a real discussion at the end. Um, okay. But yeah, thanks so much for the opportunity to present. Um, and yeah, I'm asking this question, sort of how important is subclinical TB? And specifically, I was asked to present a piece, a sort of perspective that I published in the um, Blue Journal a few months ago with uh, Surya Swastha and David Doughty, who I want to acknowledge up front that have had a sort of be a big role in my sort of ongoing thinking about this. But specifically, I want to ask the questions, what is the role of subclinical disease in sustaining TB epidemics? And then a related, but not potentially not quite the same question of should we target subclinical disease in our efforts to re reduce global TB incidence? A couple slides, first of all, just to define what we're talking about. Um, the sort of classic, or at least sort of recently prevailing um, notion of TB disease, I see Marcel smiling, is um, the, um, the idea that, you know, we have this spectrum from latent to active, or at least the, or these, states of latent and, act, latent and active. And I think some of the things that many people are coming to realize or realize again recently are that um, this um, active disease is a spectrum that you know, can be defined on multiple dimensions, but one of them being symptoms. And that you, know, you can break it down into people who have recognizable symptoms or, or don't. And I would say that even within those who don't have sort of recognized symptoms that they would report, there's probably a spectrum of whether people have no symptoms at all, or whether they have mild symptoms that they aren't just recognizing or reporting. Um, another uh, sort of feature of the bottom uh, figure that isn't in the top is that um, treatment uh, can happen at these earlier stages, um, are, uh, although it's harder um, because people are harder to diagnose when they don't have symptoms. And then I think a third important uh, feature is that these arrows are going both directions, that it's not just a steady forward progression, but when we know from pre-antibiotic era data that TB even after it develops symptoms sometimes resolves, and so likely even more so that TB that hasn't yet become symptomatic can um, move backwards, potentially resolve, which means that you can potentially have people moving on a variety of different courses, uh, natural history, or those who do progress, may progress at a variable pace. In terms of actually putting definitions on subclinical TB, um, I think it's a, hard to define in a really sort of black and white way, um, but I think it's useful to use definitions that align with data that we can um, get from prevalence surveys, which are our best way of understanding the burden of some subclinical TB right now. And so with that in mind, I'm basically defining it as being active in that it's bacteriologically detectable by culture and um, symptomatic or subclinical, meaning that if you asked people some standardized list of current TB symptoms, they would say, no, I don't have those symptoms. So this aligns with um, prevalent surveys, which typically screen people with a symptom survey and a chest X-ray and then do bacteriologic testing on those who screen positive by one or the other. But this is, um, I acknowledge it's not a perfect definition. Cultures miss some cases. Symptoms are subjective and vary in terms of how they're asked and what symptoms people think are worth reporting. Um, and this, and this, but this definition, um, allows people to maybe have intermittent subclinical, subclinical or misattributed symptoms that they don't recognize as possible TB symptoms. And the fact that it's subclinical doesn't mean that it's necessarily early or that it's necessarily going to progress in the future. 
Um, so with those definitions in mind, I think the, the question we want to ask is, would, sub, would targeting subclinical TB more than we are now be a way to change these trends? You know, we know particularly for incidents um, that, uh, you know, these data are from 2019, but um, we haven't done any better in the past year or two of COVID um, at getting TB under control. Um, and so, you know, we're not reducing TB incidents at the rate that um, the sort of global TB community has agreed with what we want to do. And, um, and the question is to get there, do we need to do a better job of the things we're already doing a lot of now, treating symptomatic TB in particular, and also delivering some pre prevent prevention to high risk groups, or should we be finding asymptomatic cases and intervening at that stage? Um, and to try to understand that, I want to explore sort of what we know and what we don't and sort of four different aspects of subclinical disease. The burden of subclinical disease, which I think we're coming to understand pretty well, um, but also the tra trajectory and transmissibility, which I think we have less of a handle on. And then finally think about detection, um, sort of thinking about what resources and logistics and diagnostic tools it would take if we sought out, to, uh, if we um, sought to go out and find it. So thinking about burden, first of all, um, the figure on the left is one that WHO puts in their global report each year, looking at the ratio of uh, prevalent TB to annual bacteriologically positive notifications in a given country. And you see that for every person diagnosed with bacteriologically confirmed TB in these 20 or so different countries that have done prevalent surveys, there is anywhere from typically one to three prevalent person years of TB for each diagnosis which doesn't mean that every person is spending that amount of time with TB. Some of them, some of the people contributing this person time um, die without diagnosis or um, resolve spontaneously or get clinically rather than bacteriologically diagnosed. But this indicates the large burden of prevalent TB that's out there at any given time. And then the um, figure at the top right is um, a meta-analysis of prevalent survey data, looking at what proportion of that prevalent TB that's identified in these different surveys is um, subclinical as defined by the standardized symptom screens used in different surveys. And it's right around 50% of that um, prevalent TB on, on the left would be defined as subclinical prevalent disease. And then, um, at the bottom right is a recent modeling analysis. This is a figure from the preprint um, trying to estimate how much time people spend with um, TB prior to symptom onset or how much time people are spending with um, subclinical disease basically or asymptomatic uh, disease. But the, the definition here is the same as what we're calling subclinical. Um, accounting for mortality and spontaneous resolution, saying for a given person who eventually develops symptoms, how much time are they spending with asymptomatic disease? And the estimate, depending on the country, is anywhere between four and 14 months. Um, and then I would just add that we're probably underestimating uh, the burden of prevalent TB if it's defined by anybody who like would be bacteriologically positive if we tested their sputum, because we know that prevalent, this is just um, sort of arbitrarily chosen data from a prevalent survey in Cambodia, but the same is seen in most surveys that symptoms, symptom survey misses some of the people who get diagnosed by chest x-ray and chest x-ray misses the, some of the people who get diagnosed by symptoms. And you can imagine that chest x-ray is more sensitive for symptomatic disease than it is for asymptomatic disease and vice versa. So probably of this quadrilateral here that represents all active TB, the bottom right that we don't pick up in prevalent surveys is probably the largest of the four corners. Um, suggesting that the overall burden of culture positive disease is um, somewhat less than our prevalence surveys are measuring. Um, so all of putting this together means that if we have about 4 million annual bacteriologically confirmed notifications of TB worldwide, there are millions of people at any given time living with what we would call subclinical TB by these definitions. Um, but most of our efforts uh, focus on, um, understandably so, what we can find. Um, diagnosing symptomatic disease, improving care of people who've been diagnosed, um, scaling up preventive therapy to high-risk groups. Um, and the, um, and, but what we've seen with that focus 
is that, you know, as you would expect over the past 20 years, notifications have increased a lot. Uh, deaths have also decreased a lot, we've seen, and which is partly related to HIV uh, treatment also, but we've seen about a 40% decrease in the absolute number of TB deaths worldwide. Um, but incidents we've seen um, often gets reported as an incidence rate, which has decreased 25%. If you put it in terms of absolute um, notifications, not adjusting for population growth, then it's only a 7% reduction in incident cases um, compared to the 40% reduction in deaths. So I guess the question is like, what would we do to change this? And is um, going after subclinical disease a way to do more to reduce uh, transmission and um, ultimately um, incidence of disease? If you look at the data that are out there in terms of studies that have tried to, um, to look at the impact of active case finding, there was uh, this uh, systematic review was just published. And um, this is the table of uh, clinical trials that looked at prevalence as an outcome. Um, but, uh, and you see here that of the sort of, you know, three clinical trials that have been done, it's the, um, the sort of recent study of expert testing of communities in Vietnam is the only one that really performs symptom agnostic case finding. Same is true for other studies that have looked at impact on notifications or other outcomes that the, uh, the mostly we have studies of symptom driven active case finding um, with somewhat equivocal results. Um, but in this one study of, um, of sort of symptom agnostic test, everyone with a bacteriologic test um, we saw that they found a dramatic reduction in prevalence, maybe partly because you're removing people from the population who otherwise would have still been persisting with one of those long courses of, um, of disease a year or more later um, if they hadn't been diagnosed and treated. Um, unfortunately, uh, this study wasn't able to provide any um, like evidence of reduction in um, infection of children. Although um, as you see that sort of there's a lot of imprecision around the estimate of the reduction in prevalence of infection among children. Um, we do have historical data that it's possible for some combination of treatment and prevention to make a dramatic um, impact on the, um, the incidence of TB infection among children, uh, from particularly from Alaska in the 1950s, 1960s, uh, when there were um, sort of initial focus on improving case finding and treatment, and then um, village-wide um, trials of um, clinical trials, uh, controlled trials, and then just um, demonstration program providing preventive therapy for all, notably doing x-ray screening of everyone before they got preventive therapy and thereby diagnosing and treating all of the um, asymptomatic uh, active TB cases that were in the population. And you see that, you know, at that time, the um, prevalence of TB infection by age five went from more than 90% in 1950 down to less than 5% in 1970. And I guess, you know, the question is what was responsible for this and how much of it was the fact that they were identifying and treating the subclinical TB in these communities. Um, so there's this large burden of subclinical disease and treating it would be beneficial if doing so would avert um, future clinical morbidity and mortality in those individuals or if subclinical disease was a significant contributor to transmission, either at the time or over its future course that you were interrupting by detecting it at the subclinical stage, and if it can be found and treated with reasonable resource investment. So I think those are the things we have to understand better if we wanna know whether this large burden of subclinical disease is something we should go after. So when, yeah, I wanna look at trajectory, transmissibility, and then talk about what it would take to detect it. Um, in terms of trajectory, uh, there's a lot of heterogeneity at the population level in terms of how people progress. You know, we know that some, um, for example, people who have um, immunodeficiency can progress very rapidly to severe clinical disease, whereas we know from historical data that there's some people and when you're talking about people who, of course, fit in, fits into this um, 
group at the left, if you can detect their disease at a subclinical disease, subclinical stage, you might avert uh, future morbidity and mortality. So clinically, that if possible, it would be important and beneficial, although it's a short window to try to detect them. Um, on the other hand, when you have people who uh, may, if undetected, live with um, people who may be contributing years of prevalent TB person time before they get diagnosed, if they ever get diagnosed. You know, if you have someone like here in the middle who has maybe intermittent symptoms and uh, that are eventually going to progress to the point of getting diagnosed, if you could detect this person far over here, um, then you could avert a large amount of prevalent person time. And, um, but, and then the, and the, and the person on the right also who never develops clinical disease and eventually resolves, you also have the potential to um, avert a lot of prevalent per person time. But this depends on how consistently disease progresses. Instead of one person with a long course of subclinical disease, you actually have lots of people in the population, each just briefly developing subclinical disease and resolving. Like if there's a lot of turnover here and a lot of backward movement from subclinical back to a resolved state, then um, active case finding, you know, finding the people who have active disease at this time point is going to have less of an impact on the sort of prevalent TB person time that you can eliminate. We also know that um, the fact that there are different trajectories and sort of some people or some forms of TB progress more quickly and consistently than others means that the cases that end up getting notified uh, that we collect data on at the time of diagnosis are um, very different from the people who get picked up in prevalent surveys. You can, this is sort of illustrating, you could imagine you have sort of a blue form and an orange form of TB where the orange form progresses quickly and the blue form progresses more slowly, sometimes resolves without any intervention. And of the arrows originating from the bottom, sort of of your incident cases, half are blue and half are orange, but the majority of the cases that reach the top and get notified are orange, whereas the majority of the cases that you pick up in any cross-sectional prevalence measurement, any of these um, vertical dashed lines, the majority are the blue form of TB. And this is seen in um, the HIV co-prevalence among um, prevalent versus notified cases in um, countries in Africa, where this um, review shows that the prevalence of HIV among uh, prevalent cases was about half the prevalence among diagnosed cases. So um, we have, you know, it's not just that subclinical TB is people earlier on the same disease course, but it's potentially different, totally different subpopulations on different disease trajectories. And there's potentially an inverse relationship between the risk of clinical morbidity, mortality, um, contribution to poor clinical outcomes versus the people who are spending a lot of time with TB in the population and potentially contributing to transmission risk. And then this is a um, figure from uh, Romain Ragani's recent uh, sort of reanalysis of historical um, data on outcomes prior to antibiotics and sort of patients who were symptomatic enough to get admitted to sanatoria. Um, but looking that even among sort of symptomatic smear positive disease, there was you know some twenty percent or so fraction who re who um, did well uh, for years, uh, seeing apparently having resolved spontaneously. So we know that even symptomatic TB sometimes resolves and that it can last a long time. For subclinical TB, I think we need to know like how often does it last for a long time? And when it does, does it remain sort of at a posse bacillary state or does it sometimes, can it be highly infectious and yet, um, and yet uh, asymptomatic for a long period of time? So are we having these short blips with lots of different people uh, experiencing short periods of subclinical TB and then um, resolving? Is it that there are some people who persist with low level disease while others uh, progress uh, quickly through and sort of an infectious state and then progress to symptoms and diagnosis? Or are there some people who have a sort of high bacillary burden, potentially highly infectious set point who persist there without symptoms or without um, significant enough symptoms to get diagnosed for a long period of time? Um, and I think understanding which of these is really happening is important for understanding what it is we would be interrupting if we were to go out and diagnose subclinical TB sooner.
So that's the trajectory, tra trajectory, which matters partly for our ability to avert future symptomatic clinical disease, but also its interaction with uh, transmission matters if our goal is to try to reduce transmission and incidence. So back to this figure before, we can now also think about how much avertable transmission these cases might generate, how much transmission we could avert if we were to diagnose them, not where the X is when they get diagnosed through um, sort of routine care, maybe not, not even where the five point star is, which is when they would get diagnosed if um, we went on and did active symptom-based case finding. But if we instead diagnosed them over on the sort of leftmost star, uh, which is where we might diagnose them if we went out and did some sort of case finding that didn't rely on symptoms. And the person on the left, you know, as we said, um, early detection has potential to be very important in terms of preventing poor clinical outcomes, but the um, duration of disease is so short that even if those um, sort of late symptomatic um, weeks are much more infectious than the rest of the disease course, there's still um, just not much person time and not much transmission that can be prevented. Whereas these other two on the right have um, potential to the blue curves here are cumulative transmission. So this is assuming that uh, symptomatic disease is somewhat more infectious. Like the curves is some, the curve is somewhat steeper during the symptomatic period than during the asymptomatic periods. But assuming that, um, if we assume that people who are asymptomatic still have some amount of infectiousness, you know, this curve is still moving upwards somewhat, somewhat then there's potential that active case finding, diagnosing these individuals much sooner could avert a large amount of transmission. The question is how much, and I think we don't really know, but we have evidence that, that subclinical TB can be infectious, first of all, in terms of its bacillary burden. We know that bacillary burden with sort of smear positivity as the most common proxy is strongly associated with transmission. For example, in sort of an odds um, comparison, the odds ratio of transmission to contacts or of TB positive contacts, comparing smear positive, culture positive disease with smear negative, culture positive disease. And you can see there's a several fold odds ratio difference there. Oops. Um, and then when we look at prevalence survey data and um, specifically focusing on just the prevalent cases that are smear positive, which is usually slightly more, slightly less than half of all of the prevalent uh, disease. Um, but even of that smear positive is, for instance, in these um, prevalent surveys in Asia, roughly half is uh, subclinical. Um, uh, symptom screen negative, but got picked up only by chest X-ray. And then, okay, so they have bacillary burden, but can people actually transmit that infection if they're not coughing? Um, and I think there is evidence that um, people don't have to have recognizable symptoms that they would report um, to a clinician or a sort of uh, prevalent survey data collector, and they could still be generating infectious aerosols. Uh, we know that people, uh, that that everyone has some amount of normal cough if you just record healthy people. They still cough sometimes. We know that people get unrelated respiratory illnesses uh, that could be a period of time when they generate transmission. And we know that it's possible to generate infectious aerosols without coughing. Um, there's some evidence for this for TB. I first made this figure, sort of, yeah, be part of the slide prior to COVID when the face mask was intended to illustrate um, this. Um, paper um, by Williams um, and colleagues that was using ultra, um, like capturing exhaled um, MTB DNA um, through a face mask and then using expert ultra to detect um, that there had been aerosolized TB. I think we now know from our experience with COVID also that at least for that other aerosol transmitted respiratory infection that there is a lot of asymptomatic transmission. Um, and then there are at least have been instances demonstrated of people uh, transmitting TB long before they develop symptoms. This is an analysis by Inyaki Komas's group that um, used uh, genomic data to estimate the timing of transmission events in a population in Spain, and then to compare that estimated timing of transmission with the period that patients reported they had had symptoms. And they found instances where the transmission appeared to have occurred a year or more prior to the sort of self-reported onset of symptoms. <laughs> 
So I think we know how we know it can happen, but in order to really um, be able to quantify how much benefit we would get from uh, sort of symptom agnostic case finding or to be able to um, really estimate the cost effectiveness of going out to find cases, we need to be able to better quantify sort of the relative amount, like what proportion of transmission is coming from this population. And I think exactly how infectious they are relative to people who have recognizable symptoms is something that remains unclear and that we need to do more work to try to understand. Um, and so the last piece I wanted to discuss is detection. Um, like what would it, okay, so, you know, it, the value of finding a case depends on um, whether they're going to either progress to clinical disease or persist with subclinical TB for a long time. And if they're going to persist with TB for a long, for a long time, how infectious are they going to be during that period? Um, but then whether it's worth going out and find, trying to find people who are going to be spending a long period of time with potentially infectious subclinical TB depends on what resources we would have to invest to find it and how we would go about doing that. Um, and I mean, community-based active case finding is resource intensive. Whenever you're trying to find a condition that's present, present in less than 1%, often well, often more like a tenth of a percent um, in most populations, your um, it's going to be uh, resource intensive. And even in relatively high risk populations, for example, shown here, prisoners in South Africa, the um, cost per case detected of adding asymptomatic screening to just symptom only screening is relatively high. The estimate here is uh, about $25,000 per incremental case that you detected in this prisoner population by doing chest X-ray um, as screening as, as opposed to just symptom-based screening. Um, but is it something that we should prioritize? And at, um, like, at what point would it make sense to go out and do this? Um, I think the optimal approach depends on dynamics that still aren't clear. And so, so I think it ties back into these questions about dynamics, that each of these different scenarios um, would, if subclinical TB is, per, is contributing to transmission, which you might think it is at least to some extent, and or to sort of future avertable clinical morbidity and mortality, sort of which of these scenarios is um, sort of most consistent with the subclinical TB course uh, determines what interventions make the most sense. If you have high turnover, lots of people developing subclinical TB, potentially um, infectious, potentially contributing to transmission, but each person only um, in that state for a short period of time, then focusing on prevention, whether that's preventive therapy or the vaccine pipeline, is probably the intervention that makes the most sense and the only way to really realistically um, prevent that transmission from occurring. If you have some people who are just staying in a very low level, minimally infectious and minimally symptomatic state, and others who are progressing through an infectious period, maybe eventually developing clinical uh, symptomatic illness as well, then you wanna be able to differentiate those that are going to go on to progress and um, focus your efforts on intervening um, on them. And so there you start thinking about looking at host status, identifying incipient disease um, or sort of bacteriologically, um, uh, or, or you look at ways to do early diagnosis that don't depend on bacteriologic burden, uh, such as chest X-ray. But then if there are some subclinical cases that have a sort of set point they're going to reach or that they have reached that's asymptomatic but highly infectious and they're going to stay there for a long period of time, then that would be the place you want to focus. And there the diagnostic strategies might be different from the tools we have now. You know, we have um, sort of bacteriologic um, diagnostic tools that are maybe more sensitive than you really need for this sort of approach. And maybe we could focus our sort of diagnostic efforts for case finding, for active case finding in particular, on trying to find the most infectious people, which would require maybe cheaper and easier, less sensitive approaches, but that could identify people who are um, most highly infectious. Um, or, and yeah, similarly like contact investigation, sort of identifying outbreaks and um, sort of backward contact tracing might be another useful tool. Um, but I think this understanding would change how we think about diagnostic development priorities. <laughs>
So um, to summarize, I think what we know about subclinical TB is that it comprises a large fraction of prevalent disease. It has meaningful infectious potential, although we need to quantify exactly what that is. It follows a heterogeneous clinical trajectory. It's difficult to diagnose using pass passive systems, but it's possible. Um, it's po it's, but it's possible to go out and find it. It has probably more epidemiological significance than is traditionally assigned. Although again, it's, we don't have the not enough data yet to quantify it. And it may account for a large fraction of MTB transmission at the population level. Once you account for its bacillary burden and the proportion of um, prevalent disease that is subclinical, um, but what fraction that is, uh, is hard to say. And so how, we, how much weight we give to it depends on understanding the relative frequency of these different patient level trajectories and the relationship between symptoms, transmission, and diagnosis on each of those trajectories. Um, uh, to put this another way, I think prioritizing subclinical disease properly depends on these unseen dynamics in terms of turnover, you know, how much is it resolving without spend, either spending a lot of time in this state or progressing to clinical disease, how infectious um, sort of cumulatively and over time is, um, is subclinical TB, how much does transmission rely on symptoms, and how, what would it take to find the ones that are most important, either in terms of their future clinical risk or their contribution to transmission? All right, so I'm emphasizing that there's a lot we don't know. And so what is the way forward? How do we fill in these knowledge gaps? Um, I think there are lots of potential research approaches here, some of which are being done, um, and, but have, like, I think, a lot of additional potential. Um, we can use modeling to make inference from cross-sectional and longitudinal population data. And we have rich cross-sectional data from prevalent surveys, as well as the cases who get diagnosed and notified. And we have some longitudinal population data, some of it, a lot of it historical from prior to antibiotics and some of it from, for example, recent studies of incipient TB. Um, in terms of understanding infectivity, I think the pairing active case finding with data collection that can characterize infectivity in detail, for example, looking at infectious bioaerosols and investigating contacts can give us a better understanding of the relative infectiousness of subclinical versus clinical cases. Um, I think those are potential for operational research as uh, active case finding and preventive therapy efforts get, begin to get more attention. I think there's potential to uh, observe at large scale the population effects of those sorts of efforts, and particularly to do things like comparing active case finding uh, with symptoms alone versus um, active case finding strategies that incorporate something like mobile chest x-ray to understand which components are having what amount of impact. Um, there's uh, sort of potential for diagnostic advances to help us move toward better understanding subclinical TB, which could mean earlier or more sensitive detection, you know, being able to detect people at, um, when they have very subtle forms of TB and understand better what that looks like. Or as I was hinting at in terms of the, potentially finding the people who were going to be contributing a large amount of infectiousness over a long period of time, there may, uh, it may make sense to invest in cheaper ways to find people with high bacillary burden, um, but no symptoms. Uh, there is uh, sort of increasingly available um, genomic sequence data and tools for being able to identify transmission events from genomic data, uh, pairing sequencing approaches with, with large epi data sets, and then also using those with um, new analytic methods that can pinpoint sort of when and from whom transmission occurs. I think has potential to give us some better, including, including a quantitative understanding of the contribution of subclinical disease to transmission. Uh, and then finally, there's uh, I think work being done that um, can be advanced more in terms of understanding and predicting the course of TB from the host perspective. You know, how to understand who's susceptible, understand, identify incipient disease, and predict who's going to progress, who's going to linger in a subclinical state for a long time, and who's likely to resolve without experiencing much consequence or contributing or having much time to contribute to transmission. So 
quick conclusion, we need, we need more focus on these earlier stages of TB because they are um, so prevalent. Uh, but targeting the right stage, figuring out whether trying to find the subclinical cases or whether we just need to be present, preventing them at the incipient or latent stage requires a better understanding of, of what of the dynamics that occur before symptomatic disease develops. And then um, collecting and analyzing data with a good understanding of these knowledge gaps could help us to shed light on these dynamics while also delivering um, uh, interventions like case finding it that are likely to be helpful at the individual and population levels. Um, thanks again to David and Surya who have Okay, hopefully Emily will come back and join us. At least it happened at the end. Yeah, exactly. Okay, well, if people have questions, they could line themselves up to ask questions. I'm. Anybody wanna put their hands up as to who has a question at least so we can get organized in advance? Mar Marcel, okay. Emily, you're coming back. Great. Did we lose Emily completely? There she is. Okay, right. good. Hopefully Emily, I didn't drop off you. after I was done, but yeah, I'm back. Okay, yeah, we were just getting organized to ask questions and the usual suspect right. put up his hand. Right. <laughs> so, so we'll let Marcel go first, but please. Uh, anyway, I'm sure lots of people have. Um, okay, so Marcel, go ahead. And then Edgar uh, has a question following that. Go ahead. Um, Thank you, Emily. If I'm allowed, Dick, I'd like to start with a comment. Um, 20 years ago, when I started teaching the TV lecture to medical students, I put the symptoms up, you know, it presents with A, B, C, D, and now I have in the slide up to half are asymptomatic. And uh, so thank you for redirecting my thinking in that direction. Um, a quick question about the asymptomatic or the subclinical. Uh, have you looked at the people who are allegedly extrapulmonary? Uh, in our practice, since we are a rich hospital and have the resources, I get three induced sputum on people with all kinds of things like uterine TB, and sometimes they come back positive, even though they don't report any pulmonary symptoms, and you wouldn't, and most of my surgical colleagues wouldn't even think of sending a sample. Is there anything that you found in the literature about that? I can't think of anything that specifically addresses that, but I, I agree with you that it's, um, uh, yeah, that it's likely that there's some amount of um, pulmonary disease in a lot of people who have extra pulmonary. Yeah, no, we're um, doing a study now looking at people who had a trace positive result on an expert ultra test in sort of community-based case finding in Uganda and trying to, you know, understand, do any of them have TB? And I think we're, yeah, beginning to see if anything, some evidence of extra pulmonary TB in, in some of those when they have, you know, very minimal sort of TB DNA in sputum. Um, but no, I, I, so I, I agree with you. Uh, it seems likely, but don't, I don't know of particular data there. Thank you, uh, Dick. Let somebody else speak. Yeah, I will. So, um, Edgar. Good morning. Thank you for the presentation. So I was wondering if there's some information about the from the prevalence service regarding what is the proportion of the asymptomatic population that is already from the high risk populations. So I was I was wondering because of uh, when talking with Dr. Menezes, uh, we think that this population is the one that most benefits because you can also treat latent TB, for example. Um, so I think that information would be very important. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think the data is available directly from prevalence surveys, both because they don't report sort of that much detail about risk factors and because the number of minors or prisoners or anything they would get sampled, if they get sampled at all in a prevalence survey would be small. Um, but you can look at the sort of ratio of prevalence among high risk populations versus the general population. And then, um, you know, there are studies that are looking at asymptomatic 
um, screening in, um, in among prisoners. For example, you know, the study I've included in my slides in, from South Africa, there's also a very recent report looking at sort of different experts, like sputum testing, chest x-ray algorithms in Brazilian prisoners. And so those sorts of studies, you know, shed light on what proportion of prevalent disease in those high-risk populations is asymptomatic, which can be compared to um, the overall population, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Puneet? Uh, thanks very much, Emily. It's a great uh, synopsis. I wanted to, uh, you know, I've been really frustrated with modelers for a long time for making up the transmission function of, uh, uh, as to what they uh, uh, assume the amount of transmission is happening uh, uh, and, and what that looks like, isn't it? which oftentimes is a, a hidden linear uh, line from some arbitrary time point to till, till time of incidence. Um, what what is that? You, you you talk about the methods for identification of transmission events, but I, I I I'd love your thoughts on what does that study look like in terms of who these methods are deployed and how where you can uh, uh, generate that objective data to figure out what portion of how much how how much does this matter? How much incidence disease is really coming from subclinical TB? So. Could you flesh out at least some possible ways that that study might look? Because I think that's really, uh, 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 you know, application yeah. of these new methods is, is, is it feels a, the right setting and the right kind of patients and whom it need, they need to be deployed. It feels not really. Yeah. Clear. Right. No, so I mean, I, I think there's potential for, you know, case control studies that would compare, like, nested within uh, sort of active case finding efforts that would compare people like prevalent cases with versus without symptoms in terms of the um, like how many of their contacts are infected, um, how much uh, uh, how much TB are they generating as aerosols, either like when they're like specifically asked to cough or just when they're in a room speaking or something, you know, to try to get at relative infectiousness. But that still doesn't get at the questions about what happens over time in terms of how with have the people with asymptomatic disease had had uh, active, you know, bacteriologically detectable TB for more or less time than the people who you know, maybe the people who have symptoms are on their way toward a quick progression to clinical disease. I mean, patients, when they get diagnosed, typically report having had the symptoms that led to their diagnosis only for like on a, a matter of a few weeks. Um, is that because, you know, that's the people who never actually progress to symptoms who are, you know, spending a lot of time, you know, contributing a lot of time with TB? Um, I... I think part of it, I think a lot of it, it has to be sort of large population scale studies, you know, do the intervention, find the subclinical disease and see, um, see what impact you have both on um, future clinical notifications, on prevalence uh, down the road and on transmission uh, measured by, you know, TST conversion studies or child um, child TB prevalence or something like that. I don't think they're easy studies. I think they're resource intensive and large and um, yeah, hard to do. But I think we're at the point that they're that it's worth uh, trying to design the studies that would get at this. And I think probably combining it with genomic data, you know, what, uh, if you're doing that sort of community study. Uh, mapping the transmission that did occur. And obviously you're like interrupting the way, whenever you diagnose someone, you diagnose this subclinical case and you start them on treatment. And so you don't know if you, you know, again, it's, it's all cross-sectional and you don't know if you hadn't intervened, would that person have infected someone? But, um, but yeah, I think it's a combination of those approaches and I don't think there is a simple study design for it. Um, but I'm super interested in trying to think through what the best approach is. So yeah, uh, welcome thoughts now or later. Um, so I have a couple of questions. One, one is a, something between a question and a suggestion. So mm -hmm. Hans Reader's uh, you know, monographs on Epi, he talks quite a bit about this issue of uh, you know, survival. He, he approaches more from the point of view of survival. But he did have some nice figures of the pre-antibiotic era and these two very distinct groups of patients, one with so-called open TB, mm -hmm. which I assumed was cavitary TB, and their rapid demise, well, rapid mm -hmm. over two years or so. And then there another group with more 
what they called closed TB. Mm -hmm. And they're uh, admitted to sanatoria and living for eight, 10 yeah. and longer years. So, I'm pulling my slides back up because one of the figure that I showed was from someone who had done a um, like re-review and summary of yes, this data this, here. This is what's called smear positive and smear negative here actually is open and open versus closed in the historical papers that they were reviewing. Okay. Yeah. yeah, so I've always assumed exactly the same that it's smear positive. So you see, uh, I mean, these smear negative group, you know, live seem to live a long time, 10 years, 15 mm -hmm. years. Yeah. And, uh, you know, not, I mean, I don't know the details of those studies and it would probably be interesting because some of them might have indeed resolved and some were persistent, mm -hmm. but someone who lives 15 years, it looks like 60% lived 15 years or more. Mm -hmm. That's a long time to live with smear negative TB, which Marcel right. will tell you is contagious. So I, I think it's very true. The only question is whether the prevalence surveys, um, you know, are detecting these people, but they're, that's just a survey. You'd have to massively screen everybody in order to find all these people. So that's anyway, sort of a comment or a question. It might be a source of information though, at least to look back at some. Yeah, you're right. I haven't looked at these studies to see whether the people who were smear positive at entry, for example, how long they remain smear. I mean, this is the, like even the methods of smear, you know, they weren't even reporting smear. Oh, it was, and you're right. It, it was sometimes based on presence of cavities. Sometimes it was based on identification of bacteria and sputum. Um, I think some, I've spoken with people who question whether this, closed category that's labeled smear negative here, how many of them actually had TB. Um, but but yeah, I think you're right that looking at those in more detail in terms of persistence of um, mm. microbiologic. And there, and there may be some information, again, I, I'm not familiar, you know, I only looked at the Hans Reeder monograph, monograph uh, but there may mm -hmm. be some information about their contacts and contagiousness. So that would be interesting. They were, this yeah. lower group, at least based on what I read from Hans Reeder, they were admitted to sanatoria. So somebody must have thought they were contagious, but maybe not. So that would also mm -hmm. potentially be some source of info. The other, the other thing is that the, the reason that mass screening, x-ray screening was abandoned apparently in many countries, um, and I remember specifically Japan was because they did studies that showed that you know these incident cases with smear positive disease cropped up in between and they felt that they weren't the yield of the annual surveys, sur you know, screening everybody was simply mm -hmm. not adequate to prevent uh, cases. So those two might provide some useful information for the questions you're asking. That's, that's interesting. I, am, I have, I'm not familiar with that at all. Thanks. Yeah, that's, yeah. that might be in Toman, case finding and chemotherapy. Okay. If you look Ikushi at that. Onozaki has summarized this data, Dick. Pardon me? Uh, Ikushi Onozaki has summarized this in Japan, the Japanese uh -huh. data historically very, very well and exhaustively and has a lot, is worth consulting on this, this matter. Okay. 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 So, I mean, all I can say, you know, Marcel's wondering about the smear negative cases. I, of course, it's a good point, but they, I mean, they did do cultures back then. They were doing smears and cultures after all. So, they might have gotten it wrong, but you know that was an era when there was a lot of TB. So, yeah. <laughs> although it's true that some might have had sarcoid and you know other diseases. Just no, I'm just suggesting some of the times when we had somebody who's got three negative smears and one positive culture, we now know in retrospect that whatever one to three percent of them were actually false positives, mm -hmm. but we didn't know before the RFLP era. Yeah, sure. Anyway, one hopes that you know. Those people living in sanatoria for 15 years weren't there because of a false positive test. But anyway. Yeah, so, I don't think they were necessarily, they remained in the sanatoria for the duration of follow-up. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah. That's true. They were admitted and discharged. Anyway, so, and the last comment is whether anyone has looked in a more ecologic way. I mean, there's been studies from the Netherlands that the infection rate dramatically dropped, you know, in the early 1950s. And that was felt to be the effect of therapy but uh, I wonder also whether it was also the effect of, you know, just better access to care, people getting x-rays for this, that, and the other. I mean, most of the TB cases we see in Montreal, uh, 
are diagnosed, picked up by x-ray, mm -hmm. you know, being done for some other reason. And so I wonder how much that contributes to, um, you know, just the general availability of x-ray and other yeah, especially x-ray because it's a kind of yeah i don't have a sense of sort of what availability of x-ray over time looks like in developing i mean in, in developed countries i know there were i mean efforts to go out and screen populations in the us for example for tb with x-ray um but but yeah i don't know I mean, today it seems like everybody's gotten an x-ray recently i don't know how long that's been the case for i just wonder whether anybody's ever looked at that yeah i don't know so so was this better done as an epidemiological study or as an interventional study. And, and you know, on one hand, if you took um, a population of patients were in an area where you had really good, just trying to flesh out what, what the study could studies mm -hmm. could look like that would yeah. inform these really quite these great questions you've summarized. On one hand, if you if you took a population where you had really good surveillance and capture of all incident disease, it didn't have any sort of you know, missing private untreated cases or something like that. Uh, and 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 created transmission chains based on character, you know, genomic characterization of those you knew, then in the sense the dark matter of you know spontaneous of, of, of things you couldn't construct becomes those you don't know, right? That becomes in a sense transmission, either from subclinical cases or and or very delayed presentation uh, from some you know remote latency, right? Yeah. And and so that dark matter kind of is part of your answer, and that's kind of the perhaps one epi way to go about mm -hmm. it, which I think you were alluding at. And the other way, as you mentioned, the intervention way. If you went in and just said that you know what there there's I'm going to do population-based frequent screening, perhaps with molecular tools uh, like low-cost, higher-throughput PCR, and you know, and 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 radiologic tools, and and really uh, aggressively intervene in the population at a, at a screening level, similar to what Greg did and presented in this forum previously from Vietnam, uh, 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 and in a larger scale, and and and, and you know, what would in a sense, you, what could you learn there that would actually help you decide of, of uh, you know, other than, you know, ex exhaustive screening in populations works to reduce disease burden, you know, what would you learn about how, uh, about the burden of to that transmission that you're averting from subclinical intervention that wouldn't have already just been caught by routine case finding and treatment? Right. Yeah, and uh, yeah, so I guess you can compare interventions that include a subclinical case finding component with efforts that are just going after the, the, the symptomatic cases with your case finding. And, uh, but yeah, but you're, so you're suggesting just look at the, try to find all your symptomatic cases and look at what's left in terms of, yeah, if you go after that aggressively and then you're gonna see some combination of reactivation from latency and of the transmission effects of subclinical disease. And I think there you, you're you know, left with questions of like how, I guess it's a question of how well do you really think you can find and treat everyone with symptoms? But mm -hmm. if you're really like, you know, going to, you know, if you're going to do a, um, like an effort where you're wanting to find every symptomatic TB case in a population, you know, where you're really going to make contact with everyone and identify symptoms. Um, and is it, how much easier is that than to go and, take a like a mobile backpack x-ray around and get get every like, screen everyone by x-ray i'm not sure it's easier to you don't even have to do, you know, see everybody in person to do a symptom screen and you have to see them in person to screen for asymptomatic disease um but but you'd have to be really comprehensive in either of those approaches like you'd have to be more comprehensive yeah. if you wanted to just remove the symptomatic disease and then see the effects yeah I, I don't know what the ideal study design is. There's not a there's not a convenient or cheap one. I don't think. So, yeah. So the only cheap ones are old studies. So Faz uh, Faz is yeah. writing to me about well, maybe has a comment and a question. So go ahead, Faz. I first thank that was a really great talk, very stimulating, and I really ap appreciated it. Thanks very much, uh, Dr. Kendall. Um, so one the quick comment was I think. The, the old studies that Dick was talking about, one of the reasons that active case funding or chest x-ray based case funding was stopped by the WHO was the study in Colleen, Czechoslovakia. And um, those papers, I think, are available online for free if you Google and do some digging. Um, okay. Where I think they did annual chest x-ray screening for three years 
and there wasn't much of a decrease in incidence and smear positive cases kept emerging between the screenings. Um, okay. But my other question, I, I think I missed a bit of Puneet's question, but uh, it kind of builds on that. This seems to clearly to be, it's such a difficult population to sample and enroll and identify. Mm -hmm. um, so this is the perfect, one of the perfect reasons to have a international really study or collaboration on this to create like a, you know, just, just to create the sample size one needs to really understand this. Are you aware of anything that's going on or is there any opportunities for us to, to join with? I'm not aware of an international collaboration. I mean, I think I'm becoming increasing, increasingly aware of different groups that are doing um, like uh, case finding with these sort of research um, focus, you know, efforts uh, in, in individual countries in, um, you know, lots of different places in Africa and Asia. I think it's worth thinking more about how to coordinate efforts and what could we learn from international collaboration that a single research group um, doing this in one country or city um, can't can't do, yeah. No, well, I think- thing that might be interesting, Emily, just to follow up on all that too, is that if you could actually follow up on one of these national prevalence surveys, mm -hmm. like just come in at the end and say, okay, let's tackle some of these issues, how contagious yeah. were these people? Uh -huh. uh, no, I, I got an email yesterday from a group at, in Seattle that's doing that in Kenya, that's doing some case finding in the like particular neighborhoods where the Kenyan prevalence survey a few years ago um, mm -hmm. was conducted. So um, but yeah, but I think that's an approach that makes a lot of sense and could be done other places too, to the extent that prevalence surveys are designed to like sample at the neighborhood level first and then individuals within those neighborhoods, it would give you a, a good place to go back and target with. Yeah, because they're well studies. designed. Yeah. And very, you know, they're usually uh, very expensive to execute. So it'd be nice to follow up and get, yeah, okay. There's yeah. also, just in terms of the Canadian, so Canada has this very inefficient uh, screening program for TB where a lot of people have x-rays with really minimal disease, they're asymptomatic. But even at our single institution, we see a fair number of TB cases through this screening program with really minimal disease on x-rays, completely asymptomatic, um, and people are smear negative and culture positive, you know, after six to eight weeks of incubation. Mm -hmm. So there could also be sources uh, that could also, you know, across Canada, we could also potentially contribute. I think this is seen in all sort of in Vancouver and Toronto, they also see this. So this could also be a, a population that could be enrolled and studied. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And your B2s yeah. or B1s when they come into the US, similar. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, and I guess, you know, it's hard to know what do you make of like some when you like diagnose someone who's subclinical and posse basilar, you know, only showing up after several weeks of culture incubation. Uh, and then you put that person on treatment. Like, what, what can you learn from that? They, you know, they weren't, they may be infectious, but not highly infectious at the time you caught them. You're not collecting longitudinal data from them because you're putting them on treatment. You know, you can, um, given the like this sort of TB doesn't just progress in one direction, I think one possibility, or like one question that's worth trying to get at is are people who are posse bacillary now, is it possible that they were more infectious previously? And, you know, can you find evidence that even though they don't, that they're unlikely to be transmitting much now, is there evidence that they transmitted to contacts in the past and that sort of thing? I think that would be a really interesting finding and interesting thing to be able to compare um, and partly, I, I guess there's enough data on um, sort of contacts and smear status, and that sort of thing at the time of diagnosis, that that's something that could be looked at in existing data. You know, our estimates that a smear negative case is 20% as infectious as a smear positive case, is that because they're actually that infectious now, or is it because they were more infectious um, uh, some time ago and their, um, they've, yeah, their best layer burden or infectiousness has gone down over time? Um, I don't know. Hmm. It might be worth uh, considering that that the you know some symptoms is a, just a poor metric sometimes for mm -hmm. understanding it. What really matters more or is did you or did you not present to the healthcare system prior to your diagnosis as a case? And then those yeah. who haven't yet presented, whether or not they self-report as symptomatic, so it's kind of the same thing, you know, because there wasn't an opportunity by the system to capture them. Mm 
Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, uh, you know, whether they were minimizing their symptoms or whether they have some and don't recognize them or genuinely don't have any, uh, you know, it's sort of kind of unknown. So uh, 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 maybe the distinction is less about with or without symptoms, but more have they or have they not ever sought health care? Because it's it's because because at an intervention level, you're either going to improve your healthcare capture efficiency if it's really all the transmissions being done from post healthcare seeking, versus if you're going if it's pre healthcare seeking, then you're going to really focus on you know uh, uh, these community based measures that you're talking about, whether it's ACF, you know, we could you know bang drums and try and get people to the clinic that doesn't work very well, but uh, uh, generally speaking, um, you know, it's the it's their health care seeking behavior, perhaps that's the better driver as to the value of, 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 of these intervent ACF interventions. Um, yeah, I mean, maybe someone though who has symptoms that hasn't yet been diagnosed is gonna be diagnosed sooner, whereas someone who really has no symptoms at all, if you don't do anything, it's gonna be um, undiagnosed for a long time. And um, the approach you would take to finding those undiagnosed cases is different depending whether you would just wanna target those who have who have symptoms that they could report versus those who don't. But no, I agree with you. The first step is moving from just passive case detection into finding people who haven't presented to the healthcare system yet. In a sense, that history is probably one of the, in, the, in any of these studies, is the most important thing that I, I find of value, which is like, you know, what is your prior yeah. healthcare seeking over the past six months or so that yeah. you've done, which might have, might have had a chance to catch you regardless of your symptoms. You know, because it's sort of where is yeah. your intervention happening? Are you screening everybody who comes to the door in the clinic, or are you doing it out in the community? And that's that's a very, that's a very uh, distinct decision note in any program. Yeah. Okay. I um. Okay, I personally have to go to the next Zoom thing. Um, but uh, I did want to thank Emily. I've had a few comments uh, from the chat box as well. Very stimulating, very interesting talk, very, very well presented. So thank you, Emily. Really a very nice overview and some very interesting uh, kind of ideas, hypotheses, uh, potential. No, thanks so much. Thanks so much for the opportunity to present and for the yeah ideas that even that this discussion has given me. I think this is yeah something that I have warrants a lot more discussion. So yeah. Good. Okay. More later. Thanks so much. Thanks again. Thanks all.